Life is becoming harder in Ukrainian cities as winter sets in and the supply of power and heat become uncertain. People in big cities cannot survive for long periods without heat. Russia's campaign to cripple Ukraine's power infrastructure could therefore trigger a new wave of emigration to Europe. Putin is resorting to terror tactics against nuclear facilities as his army loses on the front lines. Welcome to the Silicon Curtain podcast. Please do like and subscribe if you like the content we produce, and it will help introduce our amazing guests to a new audience. Anastasia Shapochkina is founder and president of Eastern Circles. She has 11 years experience in consulting and the energy industry, where she worked uh, on companies, technologies and market analysis in the renewable energy, utilities, nuclear energy and e-mobility sectors. She has led development of international cross-industry partnerships, researching projects on these subjects, and represented businesses in European industrial and research associations. Anastasia is also a lecturer on geopolitics in Sciences Po Paris since 2012, focusing on the role of business in the EU-Russia relations. She is also the author of numerous articles on the geopolitics and geoeconomics of the former Soviet Union and has regular TV and radio appearances. She's also graduated from Georgetown University School of Foreign Service, German and European Studies program. Now, I know there's loads and loads more in your biography there, but that's probably all we got time for in this segment, Anastasia. Did I get that more or less correct? Thank you. That's more than you know. <laughs> more or less here and there. Well, we can we can put a a, a, um, a more detailed description into uh, into the video notes that go along when it's published. Um, well, let's start with your area of speciality, really energy, and of course the winter war. Russia has been using terrorist methods, really using energy as a weapon to try and make up for his deficiencies on the battlefield. What we uh, what we know is that uh, before the war started, Ukraine was one of the biggest producers of energy in Europe. Really, if we compare it with any EU countries, uh, with any EU country, after since the beginning of the war, uh, Ukraine has seen massive amounts of infrastructure, energy infrastructure uh, destroyed. Today, it's uh, measured at about forty percent of energy infrastructure destruction. We are talking, of course, about power production sites, uh, about uh, nuclear power plants, which yesterday all had to be shut down in automatic mode because there was not enough power supply. Some of them, like Zaporizhia, again, remain only dependent on uh, diesel supply only. And yesterday, the whole night uh, was reconnected again today, which, of course, means uh, when you have a nuclear power plant on diesel supply, it means emergency supply of uh, uh, of energy of power needed for cooling of the uh, nuclear fuel and uh, emergency supply by definition means that you cannot rely on it for a long time and in the conditions of war in the conditions when the front of the war is very close to Zaporizhia or around Zaporizhia uh, it means also the uh, uninterrupted supply of tons and tons of diesel fuel so which can be obviously interrupted at any moment so here we're talking Nuclear power, I think, is good, is a good example. Uh, and then re last night, right, obviously, other nuclear uh, power plants uh, like the Vildenne or Milnitsky, uh, Rivne were also affected by power interruptions, which can really pose a threat to the European security equal to a nuclear bomb explosion. And if Russia decides, and that is possible, to either through uh, the interruption of power supply and thus, which can lead to melting of the, the nuclear uh, fuel, uh, the, the reactor core, or uh, through the bombing of the reactors to uh, basically cause a nuclear accident. We have to remember that there is no um, answer to that in the national security strategies of nuclear powers. Nuclear uh, security strategies presume that the attack is made by a nuclear power, which, has, which launches an atomic bomb somewhere doesn't presume that it's a civil nuclear infrastructure object which is used as a weapon of war. And this is something that of course we've been we've been observing since since the spring. Uh, now the second, of course, the level of destruction in Ukraine of uh, the energy infrastructure goes far beyond that. There are numerous uh, 
uh, heating power stations and electricity power supply power stations. So you have two types, right? A heating production and electricity production stations in Ukraine that have been specifically targeted and destroyed, even in places where destruction has been so far of civilian neighborhoods and areas rather minimal. Like, for example, the city I'm from is Kremenchuk in Poltava region. There, rather early on, the uh, heat produ production power plant has been destroyed, targeted uh, and, and, and destroyed. And as a result, a city of about 180,000 people is left without electricity, heat or, uh, or water in many areas, or the, uh, the rest restoration has to go on and on. We're talking about thousands of transformers. And uh, this is the equipment which today, according to our exchanges with the industry and the equipment producing companies, is not only in short supply, but also is facing an explosion of demand. First, because Europe has been cut off Russian gas uh, since uh, pretty much May, uh, gradually, and this cut off continues. And uh, therefore, we are observing a massive switch from gas to something else, often to electricity, thus the demand for uh, the all different types of electric equipment, electricity equipment is growing, not only in Ukraine, but across Europe, and uh, uh, also in other countries. So since the producers of this type of energy equipment are rather few, the market is not giant, they are, uh, they are facing very long list of pipeline of projects, now, which in which Ukraine is not always, let's say, on top of the list, right? Because these orders are placed in the order they're placed. And um, they're also facing the shortage of capacity, production capacity. So therefore, we're, we're, we're in this area where Ukraine today, by the Russian bombing, is facing really mortal danger, right? The, 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 this, the restoration of this type of equipment, whether we're talking about high voltage lines, whether we're talking about power lines, whether we're talking about transformers or electricity conversion equipment or uh, generators or you know, power plant uh, re uh, related equipment, this type of equipment takes a long time to produce. And now the producing industry is facing the uh, capacity um, the industrial capacity issue. So uh, this places Ukraine on a waiting list for at least a year to replace a lot of this equipment, which of course means very, very difficult winter ahead. There have been a lot of efforts undertaken by, uh, including by the European Union, of setting up the emergency generator funds, of setting up, uh, of sending relief money and financial assistance to Ukraine, specifically targeting energy infrastructure. And of course, uh, there are numerous efforts uh, by country where Ukrainian embassies are working across the world and trying to raise uh, electric power transformers, etc. And uh, there, there are efforts by company and by state and uh, by act, different actors who may have this type of equipment in their storage, in the stocks. And these stocks usually today, right, the industry, any industry is operating low on stocks. It's more lean operation, which is in fashion. And uh, the uh, the only hopes of, say, in the short run is that somebody is going to share their stocks. And a lot of people have been sharing a lot of stocks, but the level of destruction is kind of competing with this sharing of stocks. So how this winter is going to be, is going to be, lived it's, it's a question when we call our friends right in ukraine and we talk to them and we they turn on their video uh, when they have uh, electricity like power connection right and obviously they don't have it open right in kiev last week um just a few days ago actually uh, the power outages reached 12 hours a day and that of course you can figure the implications of that the heaters uh, the in the houses uh, they are lukewarm very few hours a day so when we're talking about just heat supply and this is centralized heating a lot of times and people what they're doing is if they have access to villages to private homes of any sort usually those are equipped to be heated by wood so a lot of people stock wood and is prepared to be heated like this uh, coal of course has become a big uh, treasure and then uh, people who live in apartment buildings where it's centralized heating system and this is very 
or district heating system, which have also been targeted by the Russian by the Russians, uh, they are uh, storing all types of equipment from diesel generators to the type of camping equipment based on gas, which can do like a small kind of container like this can supply a light bulb of uh, um, 80 watt, and on the other hand, the other part of equipment can supply like a little gas, um, you know, food maker. And so this is, uh, this is the type of equipment that people are using. Of course, there we're talking about the conditions when people actually have this type of, uh, mm -hmm. they have an apartment. If we I mean this, apartment, uh, yeah, <laughs> it's a totally I mean, different uh, ball game. <laughs> I'm going to jump in because not everybody listening to this will understand this idea of district run central heating, because, you know, in the UK, a lot of people's heating is is uh, based on equipment in their own house, uh, you know, individual boilers and uh, individual systems there. Um, but the Soviet model, wasn't it? It was to have a single power supply, a single power station providing sort of hot water and utilities for an entire region. Oh, and utility, yeah, not only that problem, the Russians know where they all are because the maps to the entire energy infrastructure is not a secret you know russian engineers would have seen them and potentially been involved in building the network exactly exactly and thus uh when you're thinking about the level of destruction just from one single uh targeted missile strike think about for example the destruction of this heat production uh power uh, heat production station that's right uh, on the um uh, on on the uh, one bank of the river Dnieper near near Kiev, and that automatically left one million people without electricity, heat, or water, because obviously water would would then depend on that as well. So it's it's very good point that you're making. Now, um, the again, like here we have also the the contrast would be the, the the private houses, and private houses often would have, of course, the independent systems, but in buildings and a lot of this the post soviet countries right a lot of ukraine a lot of you know it's, it's buildings and there yes this this district heating system would be really running the day to an extent the entire energy grid is um i would say russified in the in the future and following the war um ukraine and indeed europe's energy system is going to need to be decoupled from any association or relationship with either the russian energy system or the supply of, say, sort of hydrocarbon materials. Well, this is precisely what Ukraine has been already, um, you know, realizing and working on for many, many years. Thanks to this realization, several um, several uh, venues of action have been undertaken. The first is uh, the first, which I would like to cite, which is not the most on the surface, maybe is an effort since 2002, the cooperation with Westinghouse since 2002, on the development and testing uh, of a nuclear fuel, which would be able to replace Russian nuclear fuel in Ukrainian nuclear power plants. And there, I think that, again, here we're talking from about an effort which is way earlier than even 2006, 2009 gas crisis, right? When we remember Europe was also left a little bit in the cold and the pressure dropped uh, in the gas pipes uh, going through um, when, when it was when they were connected to Ukrainian uh, gas transportation system because of uh, the Ukraine-Russia energy price, uh, gas price disputes. Even before that, Ukraine uh, was realizing that you know, dependency on one fuel supplier for, for example, critical infrastructure, just like nuclear power plants was not so good. And they started working toward the diversification. It is important to realize that um, there are very few nuclear power plants which can be uh, at the same time, accept different types of fuel in general. And in order to replace one technology, nuclear fuel with another, you have to, this is, this is a complex process you have to really to develop a nuclear fuel for a nuclear power plant which technology you do not master which is the case for westinghouse it takes a lot of years for westinghouse it took about 18 uh, it took about 16 years right so they, they did industrial tests in 2018 and it went well and they started replacing the, the fuel they started in 2002 
So that's why also Westinghouse is today really extraordinarily well positioned in terms of a competitive positioning on the European market, where a lot of actors also have been replacing Russian uh, nuclear fuel in Russian Soviet uh, uh, technology and nuclear power plants across Central Europe, for example, to the extent that uh, only 440 um, uh, megawatt power plants are uh, really still dependent on uh, Russian nuclear fuel, and that dependence is going to be pretty much over when we expect uh, between uh, three to four years from now, when the latest kind of supplies are going to be ex exhausted because of course all these countries are very busy now replacing and uh, switching to Westinghouse predominantly today Westinghouse contracts potentially maybe there are going to be other 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 people in this market who knows but today Westinghouse is very well positioned and of course important to remember when we're thinking about competitive positioning of Europe right in its industrial capacity that Westinghouse fuel is produced in Sweden so it is technically a European production, which is an important geopolitical argument when people are choosing. Um, there, of course, we have Black Swan, which is Hungary. And uh, it's remained a, a loyal uh, friend of Russia, including, and, and Viktor Orban has always emphasized that nothing is going to ever happen with Fox 2, the um, nuclear uh, power plant project, which aims at replacing four 440 megawatt uh, reactors with two, uh, with two 1,000 uh, or 1,200 megawatt reactors. And this is, um, however, we know from, from the past that the European Commission has a big power of either um, either kind of really creating very significant legal obstacles to projects uh, like this, which we have seen already with Fox2, even uh, since the war in, in Ukraine started 2014. Uh, but also, uh, I think at this point, really has the power of stalling it. And um, pretty much today, I think it remains a project only on paper and in the imagination. Uh, but uh, the uh, other people in the nuclear sector in Hungary, and we have signs of this, like, for example, the regulatory, committee, the regulatory body before the head was replaced by Viktor Orban, also understood all of the risks connected to uh, to continuing doing business with Russia, and hence they themselves have put the last break on this project in last October, right before the war as well. Uh, so uh, we, we think that there is also domestic opposition to this among the, exp the, the people who really understand um, the technology. Now, this is one venue that I'd like to cite that Ukrainians took up, and that allowed them to replace uh, Russian nuclear fuel across their nuclear reactors uh, already before the war by 50%. And of course, once the was started they just said okay well in any case we're replacing everything by 100 percent and now if anybody is thinking about any new nuclear plants to ever being built in ukraine of course westinghouse had already announced uh, its positioning on this and uh, even uh, comes with the funding so it's important also for kind of if we have future here if we're facing future we're facing a future where the market will be completely redrawn the second uh, important venue that we have of course observed is the um, is the uh uh, power grid, right? So the uh, Ukrainian power grid uh, was um, configured and was kind of linked to the Russian power grid for the simple reason of uh, the um, difference of frequencies in the grid. Uh, the frequencies were different between the Soviet kind of system and the Western system back in the Soviet times. And once the Soviet fell apart, this difference didn't just automatically disappear, it continued to be. And once you have a difference in frequency between how the two networks function, that makes it absolutely impossible for one network to call upon the other in the situation of crisis. That is what how this dependency on the um, electric grid worked for Ukraine. It meant that Russia could potentially use electric grid as uh, uh, by, by let's say either through different technical means let's say uh, uh, either use it uh, in order to annoy ukraine or uh, really cause the damage uh, like through this well we have seen now that russia has resorted to much more direct uh, uh, direct uh, kind of damage uh, concerning electric but that back in the time that was kind of the the thinking and for this reason and also for with the strategic goal in mind of joining the european union not just uh, on the general market level, but also within the electricity market and the energy market, um, the Ukrainians started many years ago also this important and very technically challenging work of uh, switching uh, toward the uh, European system by pretty much changing the frequency. And this is extraordinarily difficult work. And uh, the 
there were several tests involved into this in order to test the system. Once you, you, you think that you're ready for it, you've done all of the, you've jumped all the hoops technically, you have to pass uh, two types of tests, pretty much two different times of the year when the, the, the capacity is called upon most and when the capacity is called upon less, like the least used. And that test, which was most important, the winter test, was scheduled pretty much around the dates and on the dates, not around, but on the dates of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Uh, as you remember, after the invasion, Ukrainians have continued the tests and uh, understanding also how even more important they have become. And that has been the first extraordinary lesson of resilience of Ukrainian infrastructure. And it's also a lot of its uh, professional uh, bodies in the energy sector. Uh, which showed to us that, uh, uh, which we've seen since the war, really. They managed to not only complete the tests, complete them successfully, and switch toward the uh, European energy system, electricity system. Now, the third venue that the Ukrainians have had to take, you can say anticipated, but I'd say rather had to, to kind of to, to assume, uh, was the... Um, First, the interruptions of the Russian gas supplies through the Ukrainian uh, gas transit system, and uh, later, uh, since 2014, pretty much uh, the direct geopolitical risk of dependence on the system. Since 2015, Ukraine has stopped importing Russian gas directly uh, through the Ukrainian uh, gas transit system, in, in theory. And why I'm saying this is because technically, on the paper, Ukraine was not buying Russian gas directly from Russia anymore. But what happened in, in reality was that Russia was still uh, transitioning its gas, selling its gas to Europe through Ukraine. And uh, then Ukraine would just, uh, through what we say, the, the reverse gas flows, would receive gas from Europe. But why bother? Basically, there would be contracts, which would be basically signed between European um, uh, and, and Ukrainian actors, which would then allow Ukraine to do the virtual gas purchasing, while physically it would be, of course, the same gas which would cost Ukraine. Now, obviously, all of that has been put thrown into balance because Russia has been reducing the uh, gas sales to Europe uh, since uh, uh, since the beginning of the war. So all of this, and also on top of it, has prohibited the European Union under the uh, threat of basically completely cutting off um, the countries dependent on Ukrainian gas transit system uh, from this uh, digital contract, so to say, this virtual uh, reverse flow. So Ukraine was, has been able to do this since the beginning of the war. That option has expired. And instead, though, it has really been turned out to be resilient also on the gas market side. And how is, well, is oh, you can say, because of the war, right? Because of the war itself. So first, because of all of the disappearance of demand in the industrial sectors, a lot of which have been either destroyed or uh, closed down or occupied. Second, through the, uh, because of the war, because of, the mass migration of population. So millions have left Ukraine, millions have been displaced internally, and also due to the destruction, massive destruction of uh, the housing you know, sector. So about 140,000 uh, housing units have been estimated to be destroyed as of September, as of early September. Now, these are the estimates of the Kiev School of Economics, which leads the most extensive database of destruction of uh, pretty much any type of infrastructure in Ukraine. And also uh, the people who quote them, so either it's the World Bank or other other um, uh, sources, and um, that accounted for a massive drop in demand, right? In this last uh, not last uh, ten months now, and uh, the massive drop in demand resulted in the fact that basically Ukraine's need of gas supply this year during the war. It has been reduced to about 23 billion cubic meters a year. And of those, about 20, it has been able to cover through its own gas production. And we have completely never thought about that, actually. I don't know if you have, but I mean, usually... No, I wasn't aware that there was even a major... Yes, production. Uh, you know, gas production. Gas industry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, if you followed the... Uh, uh, if you followed the scandals around... Uh, um, around uh, um, 
Hunter Biden uh, back in the day uh, during yeah. the Trump Biden campaign. Uh, you would have heard about Burisma, one of the gas production uh, companies mm. in Ukraine, and uh, that, that that's how we, we would have heard of it. But we would have never paid attention. We would have thought these were some these, these were some some pennies on a dollar, and absolutely nothing important. But actually, today it is it was, and I'm gonna just come back to it why. Uh, uh, domestic gas production, which actually uh, was able to satisfy almost all of the uh, gas uh, demand of Ukraine in wartime. And really, it's important, right, to underline this. However, you know, this is the situation. That's a fraction of the, the peacetime energy requirements. It's, it's, yeah. it's a fraction, but it's important that they can, um, because Ukraine obviously doesn't have, you know, gas liquefaction capacity, uh, got, got a regasification capacity or LNG, you know, terminals, etc. And especially, even if it did, it would have been no, no importance because uh, all of the uh, coastline is entirely uh, menaced by Russia. Uh, and uh, however, you know, even not having that, and having the Russian, you know, uh, exports cut off and uh, not being able to uh, do the digital reverse gas flow, Ukraine has to think about just to fill the gap of about about three billion cubic meters a year because it can't supply the rest with its own production. So this is an important kind of achievement as well. And hence, one of the latest strikes on energy infrastructure in Ukraine over the last two weeks have been on gas production facilities. The importance of those is not to be underestimated. Now, uh, the rest, the uh, gap which has remained, and also um, the storage, uh, which again, Ukraine possesses giant storage, gas storage facilities, and uh, uh, strive to fill some of them. And the the people who helped to fill some of them, uh, there they were uh, these people are mainly. This is Norway. It is. Uh, uh, also, um, to 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 lesser extent the the, the US as well, and uh, uh, basically that this could be delivered through the reverse uh, pipeline gas flows. So whatever is captured through the um, through the liquefaction, uh, so regasification terminals. So just to say, here are the three kind of avenues that Ukraine took to diversify its energy supplies from Russia, whether we're talking about nuclear, whether we're talking about power or gas. And today, therefore, it finds itself in this situation. Now, once the gas production facilities are bombed, once we're talking about truly, you know, going toward total destruction of energy infrastructure, how tenable this is, you know, what strategies to introduce. Um, if we had to imagine the future and let's say on the bright side uh, that Ukraine regains its full territorial integrity, I would say that the preconditions are perfect uh, because of this massive destruction for the any redrawing of the energy system, in fact. So not going from centralized to decentralized or anything. But this is a very complex task, and only a few people in the world and big, big energy companies understand how to execute it. But just to say that the level of destruction is such that of course, it's more and more scary to live. I think every day, if we think about it. So really, it it it, it would be opportunity to replan and rethink the entire network and how it exists and its dependencies. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's what the, 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 the network, I would not say the network, but rather the system, the energy system, right, which would involve down the production units, the types of uh, mm -hmm. transportation distribution, and uh, there you would then, you could then reimagine how it works. And it's precisely what the Ukrainian government has said, because obviously if you don't have any more that possibility to import gas uh, from a predictable supplier and then the European market is all in the covered in the unknown right in terms of the gas market and the Europeans are switching from gas to coal from gas to wood cutting down their uh, their trees you know and in order to, to again replace gas with something and the nuclear power plants take a long time to extract so we cannot hope they cannot hope uh, to be dependent on the European um, you know gas supplies from Europe from any other source because Europe itself is scrambling and thus, what can they hope for? And what the government has said, and their um, when they were presenting their reconstruction plans, they've mentioned that one of their ambitions is to redesign the energy system to become to make it more reliable on, for example, renewable energy sources. And renewable energy sources can be different, different, different things, but also can presume a more decentralized energy system if we think it to the very end.
Of course, not all of the baseline electricity production, such as coal, gas, or nuclear, can be replaced with intermittent energy production, such as uh, renewables. However, uh, different different designs are possible, and there are also renewable energy production sources like biomass, let's say the wood, right, or uh, hydro, which is also can 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 be not intermittent and hence more reliable. And of course, you know, one of the big changes this week, and one reason why it's going to be, I think, very difficult, not only physically, but also politically, to go back to normalizing energy relationships with Russia. And that is the designation of Russia as a terrorist state. Initially, it was the Baltic states and the Eastern European states that did that. They've always been way out ahead in calling out Russia and, and warning, uh, of course, about its behavior. But then the EU followed the move of NATO. What are what are the implications or significance of that designation of Russia as a terrorist state? And, you know, might the UK and US follow follow suit as well? Yeah, this is a very important step. Uh, and the consequences would be the same. I, th I think the consequences would be of obviously much greater difficulty of doing business with Russia. The doing business with Russia now would be already has become very difficult, but would be as difficult as doing business with North Korea or Iran. And that means that if the US especially follows suit, right, already the sanctions themselves are uh, any US sanctions are going to have the power of touching any, uh, if they're well developed till the very end, they have the power of touching any country in the world and uh, affecting their behavior. But designating Russia as their state is like a, would be equal to an agreement between um, among, among Western society and Western economic powers uh, that uh, their trade with Russia will be pretty much brought to nothing. And, uh, or if it's going to remain, I just don't see how it's going to be compatible. So it's going to be either phased out or brought to nothing. And of course, the reason I think that there is not yet a complete, uh, like the proclamation between that proclamation and then the concrete steps, the, the distance is that between policy and regulation, right? So you have to develop regulation, has to follow policies. This is, you have to all kind of, uh, to spell it out. What is it going to actually mean? We'll see this, I think, in the coming weeks. Um, and I think it's a good time to be a lawyer. It's a good time to work in due diligence. <laughs> You're not going to be uh, jobless. Uh, and uh, definitely it will be very busy. And, uh, but uh, in the end of the day, it's also something that is very difficult to undo. Oh, that's yeah. what I was going to ask. That was going to be the question was, you know, it's taken a long time to designate this status. And I imagine very vigorous debate behind the scenes. But once that label is applied, as we've seen in Iran, it's extraordinarily difficult to then climb out of that hole, isn't it? Exactly. And uh, just uh, since also both uh, NATO and then the EU have pronounced uh, the um, very important um, desire of Ukraine and the important goal of Ukraine, next to announcing Russia terrorist state, they also said that uh, they would also seek the creation of special tribunal for, for persecuting of, of crimes against humanity and that ties the two for me and we're gonna again we're gonna see how it's gonna all play out right now we just have the announcements we have to comment what we have but uh, for me this ties the two and this means that uh, that the world is getting on the same page with ukraine the western world at least um, which again has the power to still have some levers, especially the United States, over some parts of the rest of the world, and uh, that they uh, tying the two means that they want to they're getting on the same page with Ukraine in their demand for retribution and saying that it's not just okay. Let's say one day, hypothetically, Putin decides to stop the war for no reason whatsoever, just wakes up new man and he says enough is enough. So he withdraws all the troops, restores Ukraine to its uh, borders uh, uh, before 2014, and everything is back to normal. Well, that, according to the announcements that we've just heard, is not going to stop there. It's not going to automatically lift up the terrorist state label, because the terrorist state label is being imposed in return for the crimes against humanity, hence 
the international community is saying, we are going to then demand the creation of the international tribunal, which is not just going to be creating um, high paid jobs for uh, Western lawyers, but also is going to require Russia to, uh, in exchange for getting back to whatever the new normal can be, one day, let's say hypothetically, uh, to also give out some people to be tried in the tribunal. And that is a totally different mm. level from anything that Russia has historically found itself. Just to give you an example, uh, because R Russia, Russia has a very difficult relationship with, with history, right? And to give an example, is World War One is a very good example. World War One is is a war where Russia fought as always on the wrong side, <laughs> starting out with Germany and then eventually falling out of the world together and uh, uh, and signing the reparation treaties, uh, peace treaties uh, under Lenin, who sought the uh, weakening of the Russian Empire uh, through uh, so so that he could could, could win the civil war faster in the, uh, during the revolution and. Uh, the outcome of that, since, since it was eventually Lenin who won the, the day and, and the, the civil war and it became Soviet Union, the outcome of that is that it is it is pretty much as good as impossible to find a monument to World War One in all of Russia. A single monument. I never thought of that, but uh, that that's true, isn't it? I never never saw one. And then, of course, to say nothing of uh, to say nothing of the, the the difficulty that the Russians have with counting their dead, right? Uh, and it may be not connected to only the simple fact that today, let's say, we have numerous um, testimonies from both Ukrainian and Russian sides with pictures and videos attached to them, right? Which show fields, uh, as far as I can see, covered with bodies of Russian soldiers who nobody comes to pick up. So obviously, you have a difficult time counting the dead if you never bother to come and pick them up in the first place. But in general, this is a big problem as well with Russia, right? You never know how many people really have died in Afghanistan. We never know how many people have perished in the first or second Chechen war. We never know even how many people have perished during the putsch of August 1991, nor during the putsch of October 1993. So whether we're talking about massive amounts or small amounts of people, this count is super difficult. To say nothing of World War II, where the count of the dead went from 7 million right up to the war to 27 million under Yeltsin. <laughs> and it's the same. It's the same with um, it's the same with the repression in the 1930s. The only organization that was actively researching that, uh, Memorial, has been shut down. Their members have been um, uh, threatened, chased out of the country, imprisoned, um, even and despite yes. their work. I mean, they never came to a figure, right? We still don't know how many it's people not, died. To say nothing of their gulag, their Kripalago gulag. And just to say that, therefore, when you're talking about the, the ambition of, the, European, of, of the, the international community now to create this tribunal and to pressure the Russians to give out some people to be tried, well, to go from here where we are today with the propaganda getting crazier and crazier by day with the distance the propaganda has brought in this last 10 months is just hallucinating it's unbelievable distance that they've covered and they went completely into space in terms of the absurdity now to imagine going from there to somebody who knows who turning some people even to an international tribunal i think that the terrorist status is going to take a very long time to live and rather, also given the disregard for human life in Russia, mm. given the long history of repression and the numerous interests today that are thriving on the war and which have all of their economic and political interests in having the war going on as much as possible, I do not see at all the resolution, how the resolution of, of, of the mm. conflict and how, therefore, the lifting of the terror state can be achieved in any length of time. And even if the war is over, and let's say a regime change in Russia comes, you have to have the population adhere to this. While a lot of the population, or at least part of the population, does support Putin, believes in the war, some people go there, some people, according to what we understand, few people go there voluntarily, but still some people go there voluntarily. Mm -hmm. A lot of people support the war from the couch, and don't go anywhere. and. Hence, you know, this whole you kind know, of process through which Germany went through after World War II, 
is very difficult to imagine in Russia, especially since Russia has never done it in the sport history. That's it. And the terrifying thing for me, I think, is that having been there in the 90s and obviously read Russian history, and you read these terrifying things you've just described in the history of the First World War, the Civil War, the 19th century even, but but you know, especially you know, the 1930s and so on. Um, and you know, in principle, that a place is capable of these kind of traumas and tragedies. Um, and yet I had some hope that after 30 years of relative freedom, some hope that after 30 years of the development of a, of a proto-market economy and the availability of multiple information sources, yes, you have propaganda sources, of course you do, but if you really wanted to go and find out what's going on in the world, it's no longer impossible to do that. Um, and yet the wastage of human life, the callousness, the inefficiency, the corruption, the death toll is significantly higher in this war on the Russian side than even Afghanistan under the Soviets. In some ways, it seems to me that we've taken a step back, not to the 1990s, but actually far closer to the 1930s than, than any other decade. Especially if you think about what's going on inside Russia, any mm. type of protest, any inscription on a wall can bring you, even going out, like people have shown, right, with their bitter experience, and going out on the street with a piece of paper which says a blank oh, piece of paper. A piece of paper, they can be uh, taken to prison, they can face years of prison. So, of course, the government, since the last 10 years at least, has been working very hard to cement the political environment and to have make sure that nothing grows through the, through the paper. Absolutely. Well, uh, this contrasts because we've, we've, we've only really mentioned Russia and, and the energy system so far, but there's been another, you know, if we look at this 30 year period, there has been extraordinary developments and evolution on the Ukrainian side. So we recently had the anniversary of Maidan, the resolution of dignity. That provides an alternative template, doesn't it, of how a post-Soviet society can actually evolve. Um, obviously, in fits and starts, multiple revolutions, a fair degree of chaos, not all the problems are fixed overnight. Nonetheless, and there are some interesting historical lessons, aren't there? And Ukraine has evolved in 30 years. If you were to compare now to that period of, of uh, when it first gained independence. Absolutely, yes. So we can see, uh, albeit comparing Russia, Ukraine, and Belarus, today we know it's, it's, very, it's a futile exercise. But uh, if we compare the products that we've seen in Russia in 2011, 2012, the massive products, tens and tens of thousands of people uh, in numerous cities, right, men, uh, protesting against, um, against the, um, uh, the changing of the regime, which, which was supposed to be automatic between Medvedev back to Putin, uh, and then we compare that to uh, the protests in Belarus in August 2020, and then to the protests in Ukraine in 2004-2005, and then 2013-2014, but especially 13-14, the Maidan, Euromaidan, and the Revolution of Dignity. Of course, one sharp contrast jumps out is the reaction of the protesters toward violence. And Ukraine, Ukrainian protesters were the only ones who were ready and prepared and willing to meet police violence and state violence with violence and keep up this for a long time. Now, the uh, one argument, uh, one argument uh, kind of against the strategy is that, well, you see what happened, right? In any case, Russia ended up invading Ukraine immediately in 2013 and then developing it into a full-blown war in 2022. Yet, if we're talking about Ukrainian internal policy, politics, and the capacity of the people to take over, to take the power, we remember very well in 2014 that there was a crisis of leadership. There were over 1 million people pouring on the streets of Kyiv, a city of 3 million. And uh, when the three so-called leaders eventually jumped up stage, 
and started signing things with the West because the West wanted to find, uh, to fill out the people who first could speak English and can could sign documents. And it was a problem with the previous president who had to jump ship and run away from Ukraine. He, he had a problem not only writing and signing or speaking, but so they, they, were, they were filling out for people who could actually, they could actually work with. And they found that they identified the three people who they thought would be, would be well positioned as leaders and just to find themselves in a totally futile exercise because whatever three people sign one one day the crowd will reject the, uh, the next and the reason was that the crowd was not having a leader there was no ukrainian Navalny, and the crowd also was already experienced this was the this was the, the on the foundation of 2004-2005 protests that were, were, were which where the 2014 you know, revolution of dignity was grow, grow, has grown. And on that foundation, the Ukrainian civil society was, was grown and developed into what it has become, which is a true national force. And after 2014, continued to develop into today what you see, the uh, uh, terra barona, the defense, territorial defense, the absolutely undistinguishable a role of civil society, the people and the army, everything is connected because of all of this time that the Ukrainians you know, given themselves and empowered themselves to the point of kind of pushing back the limits of, of power in the state. But I want to say that this is not born in a vacuum. Ukrainian history, if you look at it as much as you can, separating it from the Polish and the, and the Russian history, right? You could see that the Ukrainian society has had a long history of working exactly this way uh, throughout from the Middle Ages, let's say, to about the 17th century, uh, the end of the 17th century, when the Moscow principality was you know, allowed to, when they, they, they get the, 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 the hetmans of the Ukrainian Cossacks signed the treaty with the Moscovites and uh, in their struggle against the Poles and the Polish king. But but by that time, by the mid 17th century, you had already about 250 years of the very strong presence of the Cossacks who had their own system of governance, their own system of relationship with the population, and who were a formidable military force with a totally democratic governance to the point that the any the, the, the democratically elected leader or hetman, uh, if he made any major military mistake, for example, not sharing enough of the military gains with his uh, comrades and with the soldiers, he could have just been killed by the same people who had elected him before. Democracy was extraordinarily direct and extraordinarily hands-on. There was no coup d'etat, there was no palace coup, there was no palace. It was just extraordinarily direct democracy. He would be surrounded and basically murdered by his own right-hand right, right -hand man. And this was a common practice. So the leader was extraordinarily accountant to the population in this system. And this system is something which is a nucleus of Ukrainian national identity today, which is a nucleus of Ukrainian national self, kind of self-determination, self-history, let's say own history, in between the two kingdoms which have tried to conquer Ukraine throughout history, which is the Polish and the, and the, the Polish kingdom then back then and the Moscow principality, which had evolved into the Russian empire. So for me, we are not seeing this we shouldn't see this in a vacuum. Like there was nothing, and then there were these 30 years. I'd say that there was the movement of building up the Ukrainian national identity, which kind of tried to spring up during the Russian Revolution, 1917, and failed, and then was crushed eventually after the end of the Civil War, and then which came up again, resurfaced 1991, and so far is sustaining itself. But it's based on that history. Mm -hmm. And in fact, the the Holodomor, the Holodomor in the 1930s is also an attempt to crush and destroy those flourishings of nationalism, uh, those uh, any sign of independence or even creativity and culture that's going to move Ukraine away from the imperial, uh, you know, canon of culture. I mean, we've seen that almost continuously. Yeah, 
And so the more was targeted toward the peasants, and the peasants basically artificial famine, right? So you're confiscating the food uh, by the Russian, by the Soviet army, and then shipping it up to Moscow, yeah. and then uh, Ukrainian peasants left basically to die out of famine. And the reason the peasants were targeted, and also the peasants were targeted also in the, elsewhere in the Soviet Union, by the way, mm. like Russia, also in Central Asia, etc. But just to say that the reason the peasants were targeted was because, of course, for the peasant, you don't have to explain to a peasant what is private property rights. He knows that this is his whole life. Without private property rights, he's nothing, and he doesn't he doesn't understand anything better than private property rights. And this type of person, of course, is impossible and intolerable for the Soviet regime, intolerable also for the current Russian regime, because that's precisely the right on which the whole capitalism is based, right? Which on which the whole Russian system of cronyism and authoritarianism is based. Because you take that away, and thus you can destroy any single oligarch in your country, and every oligarch knows it means absolutely nothing without the uh, Kremlin's support. And the best uh, description of this was given actually by a former Russian oligarch, Sergei Pugachev, who was finding uh, himself now somewhere very much deep abroad, and uh, is uh, uh, is. Uh, uh, Share, was sharing his, um, uh, uh, reminiscing on his past uh, uh, connections with Putin in one of the interviews uh, he, he gave recently. And there he said, it, what the West should understand is that you know, for Putin, there is no you know, monetary value that could affect him because he just owns the whole of Russia. He owns every single square centimeter of land, every single piece of property, and every single person. He can take anything he pleases from anyone and nothing is going to happen to him. And this precise concept is absolutely intolerable for Ukraine from the peasant level to the very presidential level as we have observed. That's right. And it creates the impression, and many of my other speakers have said the same, that you know, in Ukraine what you've got is a bottom-up culture, um, which may appear chaotic. It may sometimes appear even arbitrary, but it comes from the bottom-up. There's a self-organization and that sense of, as you say, ownership and power, there's a lot of fighting over it, but it's something organic and it, and it rises up and it can change. Now, of course, you have a lot of palace coups in Russian history. You have a lot of murder. You have all sorts of terrible things, but they're top down, aren't they? The whole of Russian history is the story of a top down approach. And even the 1917 revolution, which people think is some great organic popular uprising, I mean, that's the first one, the February one, but the second one is more of a small band of terrorists basically picking power up off the street. More Almost all of... the movements are top down rather than bottom up. Well, I well. would argue, I would argue there. I would argue that first to kind of clarify the history on the on the coup d'etat, which which winded up with murders of the years. It's mm. just to really clarify that the Russians in the Russian history, there are examples of murders of, of the kings. That's no problem. However, there is no example of a murder of a absolutely terrible somebody who was extraordinarily bloodthirsty. There is no yes. history of murder of Ivan the Terrible, Peter the Great, or Stalin. Yeah. The history, rather, gives us the murders of leaders, quote unquote, such as Peter the Third, the unfortunate husband of Catherine the Great, <laughs> uh, Paul the First the unfortunate son of Catherine the Great and unfortunate father of Alexander I, who was considered the great, great the, the amazing grandson of Catherine the Great, who was considered to be behind the murder of his father by uh, the palace coup. And then, of course, uh, uh, Alexander II, who uh, was the uh, Tsar who abolished slavery in Russia around the same time as slavery was abolished by Lincoln, Lincoln in the United States, and who was also murdered just like Lincoln by a terrorist, which was in Russia, a terrorist organization, uh, which uh, was anarchist. And none of these leaders was famous for their cruelty or their totalitarian inclinations. Some of them, like Peter III or Paul I, were weak, were found weak, not only in their body, but also in their head. And then leaders like Alexander II uh, could be obviously credited with a lot of the Western, modern Western values. and. Uh, that was definitely one of the most progressive tours in the whole of Russian history. Yet never happened. And of course, Nicholas II, the most famous murderer of, of, of the time. Uh, now, as for the uh, popular uprisings, of course, there were numerous popular uprisings in, in Russian history, including the uh, one of the most massive, most, most, most famous is Pugachev uprising in the end of the 18th century, absolutely crushed and drowned in blood by Catherine the Great. Um, 
the 1917, uh, when you were thinking about the revolution, you were thinking about the actual, you know, kind of the, the, the start of the bloody revolution, so mm. to say, by Lenin and the, uh, and the uh, kind of interruption of what was supposed to be the Universal Assembly uh, by, the, by the bunch of Bolsheviks supported by, you know, a couple of hundred of, of sailors. But um, when, when I'm thinking about the revolution in 1917, I think of this whole movement of people which started from February and was continuing mm. and led to the General Assembly, in fact, uh, in October, before Lenin, and already then the uh, control was lost, but no power center was found, no leader was found. And I'd say that the presence of numerous parties, the absolute, you know, absolute uh, loss of control over the army as well, right, uh, were the signs that the revolution was already ongoing. And then there was just no leader who was uh, who was there. And Lenin tried to position himself as this leader by the means of terror, that which unleashed all of the forces of the revolution. Because again, the revolution didn't happen in October. The revolution kept happening till about 1924, right? mm. the end of the civil war. It unleashed the forces, revolutionary forces, which poured out into the civil war. And the victory of the Bolsheviks was far from certain for many years after 1917. And I think you know it leads to um, it leads to the idea that what Russia needs is a Maidan, but it's very unlikely to happen for a variety of reasons, isn't it? I mean, less likely than 1917 because you had you know decades of agitation, not nearly so much repression under the Tsars as you later had under the Bolsheviks. Um, much more liberal press. You had a concept of you know reactionaries and liberals. You had a certain amount of debate, maybe not in the peasant class, but in the you know certainly the intellectual and the officer class. There's far more of a I want to say civil society that started, I guess, in the early 1900s. But you're looking at a very different country now, haven't you? Where over decades and decades, civil society, the ability to self-organize, any kind of political groupings that the state doesn't control have been crushed ruthlessly, I, it's difficult to see how any kind of Maidan process could even get going in Russia. Exactly. Unfortunately, I I have to agree with you. And the reason for me why is that, uh, again, for at least the last 10 years, the state has been very, has been arming itself and preparing for something like a, a Maidan, a Russian Maidan, and to prevent it, it has created a massive security apparatus with hundreds of thousands of people existing and getting amazing salaries just in order to keep the, uh, you know, this, the masses of population under control. So today, even if hundreds of thousands of people decide to rise and get out of the streets, there are more people to meet them with machine guns than themselves without the machine guns. And second is I don't think that there is even there is even such a tendency because the, the, the this kind of the fear has been so much inculcated into the Russians today through the oppression and through the real risk of not the real risk but just certainty of repression in case of protest and uh, uh, also through this important. Uh, phenomena which was very well described by the Russian anthropologist Alexandra Arkhipova during a conference we did in Russia uh, actually this week at Science Po, uh, where she was uh, citing an impact of this state repression. The, one of the major outcomes was the creation of an impression of a total isolation of each person who is against the regime that they are made to believe through the propaganda and through the oppressive mechanisms that they are alone in opposing the regime, that no one else, if they go out on the street, no one will ever join them. And this is done physically, but when people go on the streets, they get surrounded by a little tight circle of police. And they find themselves in this very unpleasant company where they are literally alone. They're cut off. They don't even see if there is anybody else, maybe they're surrounded like them, or grouping right behind the circle of police. And this is important. Basically, the, the repression reaches physically to people's houses, today through mobilization, but also before through uh, arrests, through arrests after the demonstrations. Demonstrations are over. Some people are arrested. Everybody else goes home. And then 
Other people find themselves fired, other people find themselves arrested, the searches, etc. So maybe two, three weeks after the demonstration already died out. And uh, finally, through this mental impression. Mm -hmm that you are alone. Everybody agrees with the government, everybody supports Vladimir Putin, everything's amazing. And th thus, nobody really knows anymore what goes on in Russia, really, including the Russians themselves. And that's how they turned the Belarus situation around, wasn't it? It's not that they convinced people suddenly to love Lukashenko or to support the regime. They knew that was impossible. What they did was flood the country with um, propagandists. They replaced the native Belarus propagandists with their own they selectively arrested tortured individuals to demonstrate to everybody else that it was pointless and then rather than saying you know we're right you're wrong they're saying well you, you of course you're right you know of course this is a dictatorship but you won't win exactly. you won't win and you can't win exactly and in belarus of course uh, there were tens of thousands of people who went through arrests and through torture in prisons. Mm -hmm. And that was done purposefully in order for them to spread the message to everyone else and to make sure that this will to protest is completely beaten out of people mm -hmm. because they know it's useless. Yeah. And this is, I think, well, you know, we'll end, end on this one, I think, because we've reached the end. But, I mean, in conclusion, we can say that this way of doing things, Ukrainians, every Ukrainian understands this. They understand the Russian way. They understand what Ruskimir actually means. And I think it's difficult for many in France, Germany, even the UK and the US. I think they fail to really grasp that fact that this is a fight for survival. And every Ukrainian knows what would happen if the Russians came to dominate their city, their town, their organizations, their family, they so, know how it would break down and destroy. Uh, even if they survived, it would break down that entire social and political infrastructure. Yeah, this is exactly it. And uh, uh, during our Ukraine conference last week, uh, we had some illustrious Ukrainian experts uh, come here to Paris. And one of them is Hanna Shellist, is a great expert on defense and security. And she was saying uh, in one of her uh, one of her conversations that uh, Ukraine is not fighting for land. What Ukraine wants is not 10 square meters, additional square meters of territory. It is the fighting for people because it knows that every single town, village, municipality occupied by the Russians has like just population enslaved. It can be recruited to the army and mobilized, can be shot, can be tortured. And this is the experience of absolutely every single a place where the Russians have passed, have occupied, or still are occupying. And of course, Alenar DNR, the parts of regions of Donetsk and Lugansk Oblast of Ukraine, have bore an intense witness by having lost almost all of its male population in these last eight years, especially very intensely the last few months. And uh, this is something that Yes, every Ukraine understands. And this is something I think that in the West is not understood for the most part. And what, ex what is, makes it so difficult to explain to the West the negotiation position of Zelensky, but also the support of the broad masses of population that he faces. I think this is one real thing that the West doesn't get. Well, Anastasia, this has been absolutely enlightening. Uh, I've learned far more about the situation with the power than uh, the, that I knew before, and I think it's a it's a it's a strong conclusion to end on. Really understanding what the Ukrainians are fighting for and why they're going to win this as well. So I really appreciate you spending this time talking to us. Thank you so much. Have a great evening.